Looking at how dreams turned into nightmares for some now here on BBC One Scotland, as new money and media brought seismic changes to Scotland's so-called beautiful game, football was undoubtedly transformed. But was it always for the better? In 1998, Scottish football signed a deal with B Sky B that brought the world to its door. The deal resulted in greater exposure, live TV coverage of matches, a focus on entertainment and a much increased pot of money to promote the game. Football had become a global brand and Scotland was keen for its share of the action. But the money came at a price. The contract affected kickoff times, top players demanded higher wages and TV now called the shots. It was a whole new ball game. For many, Scottish football's selling point was the drama of the old firm games between Celtic and Rangers. They may have attracted the viewers, but they also brought their own problems. Clubs desperate to compete in this new world were vulnerable to harebrained schemes, mavericks with money, and ego-driven illusions. Almost overnight, the dual drivers of money and media transformed the game, but left Scottish football struggling to forge an identity that would carry it into the future. There's an intensity in it, and often a rawness at a live event. You could almost feel the stadium kind of moving as a living entity. The perfect storm. A league decider at Celtic Park. The Rangers could win at the home of their bitter rivals. A 6.05 kick-off on a holiday weekend. The match is the climax to a newly formed business venture which began one year earlier in 1998, the SPL, the Scottish Premier League, made up of the top 10 to 12 football clubs in Scotland. It had been formed to push the Scottish clubs into an increasingly globalised marketplace. This showdown will be watched by millions of people in almost 120 countries around the globe. Such is the magnitude of this match. The rights to broadcast the SPL games had been sold to Sky Television, giving them control over scheduling and kickoff times. Holding an old firm game at six o'clock, at a time when actually they were getting so early that you, know, you were lucky if you'd finished your breakfast if you were wanting to go to one of the games because they were getting earlier and earlier, and here was a game actually getting late at six in the evening. It's one of the biggest fixtures in world football. The players in Old Firm matches are well warned before the matches about the possible effect of their behaviour on spectators, both within the ground and further afield. Celtic just losing the discipline here, and this will be a yellow card for the set. Stefan May has to calm down here. He's off. Hugh, oh, he's gone back to have a pop at Hugh Dallas and his teammates have got to get Stefan Mahi away because he's losing it here big time. Ten players were booked. Three were shown red cards. It's the third red card on a controversial evening in Glasgow. There were numerous pitch invasions. Oh, no, we've got a supporter on the pitch here and 113 fans were arrested over the course of the event. Hugh Dallas has been hit by something. And these are shocking scenes at Celtic Park. There's that intensity and that rawness which 
In one sense, it's what television wants when it wants live sport, but it doesn't want too much of it because there's a line and occasionally uh, that line is crossed and that was one of those games where the line was crossed. Well, they put us all to shame, these scenes. The atmosphere of this fixture is nothing short of poisonous. I had as my guest the head of sport at Sky and Vic and I looked at each other and we both realised that we had a problem and somebody else came over to us both and was gleeful because it was great television. But I realised that the morning after was not going to be a lot of laughs. He and I spoke maybe five, six times over that weekend and both of us asked each other you know, if we could continue. Remember, the whole cornerstone of the SPL was based around that contract in the 605 game. That time had never been agreed by the police. If we had to move the time slot, Sky would have been able to say we're walking away. That was a seminal moment that the SPL could have died then. The finances of the SPL would have gone. So that was two or three very, very heavy days. Television's grip on football began in earnest nine years earlier with the arrival of Sky Television. February 5th, 1989, the dawn of television's new age. One of their first moves was to invest around £190 million in the English Premier League, giving them the right to transmit English games all over the world. The armchair fans and their subscription fees were about to become key players in the future of football. The FA Premier League, live, only on Sky. It's a whole new ballgame. It took the arrival of Sky to make all the other broadcasters, I think around the world, realise how important sport was. People in Scotland would say, I'm, I'm going to watch the game in the pub. What game is it? It doesn't matter, it's a live game. Television was always important to football, but it has become the absolute key financial driver of football. The fans have become less important in many ways, and subscribers uh, and television viewers have become more important. In terms of the drama that was needed to bring in an audience, there was no doubt what the SPL's biggest selling point was. People don't like to hear this, but Celtic and Rangers finance Scottish football. There's no sponsorship without Celtic and Rangers. There's no TV deal without Celtic and Rangers. The old firm are that kind of double-edged sword for the Scottish authorities in one sense. Part of them actually, you know, resents the circus that goes with it. But in an age where all the football leagues look kind of similar, you have to differentiate yourself because you're in a selling market and the old firm offer you something that's different, that's distinctive and unique. So the kind of challenge you have is how do you kind of market that side of it while recognising there is a kind of a potential downside to that. Um, and that's, that's a kind of an interesting dilemma. It was a dilemma that had haunted Scottish football for decades. This is now like a scene out of apocalypse now. It may have been a good story for television, but it wasn't so good for the country. One particular series of events revealed to the rest of the world the unpleasant underbelly of Scottish football and society. Packages containing bullets have been sent to the Celtic manager Neil Lennon. Let's continue to investigate a parcel bomb campaign against Celtic manager. Police confirmed Lennon was sent a parcel bomb designed to kill. Here we were in socially enlightened 21st century, fair and just Scotland. But amidst us was this high profile um, captain, then manager of Celtic, who was being subjected to a, there's no other way to put it, a campaign of terror. Two Glasgow University students who attacked Celtic star Neil Lennon admitted drunkenly chasing the footballer in his car before spitting and abusing him. Neil Lennon arrived and Martin O'Neill arrived, two high profile Catholic figures in football. They came to Scotland from Northern Ireland and it all kicked off. Issues that Scotland thought had been consigned to the past were suddenly reignited. He expected uh, um, a certain amount of abuse 
I think obviously when I get really out of hand, when you, you don't mind the hate mail, uh, but um, when uh, uh, bullets are sent through the post to you, I think that's when it can get uh, absolutely nasty. He was going to stick up for himself. He would comment in the press, he would defend himself verbally, he would sometimes defend himself physically. He wasn't going to take any of this abuse lying down. Skirmishes, arrests, inquiries and summits, recorded, photographed and broadcast to every corner of the world. The story ran and ran, even as the aggression towards Lenin heightened. I was about seven or eight yards from where, where it happened. I remember thinking, can you imagine on Match of the Day seeing Arsene Wenger being attacked by a fan? Or Jose Mourinho? You just couldn't conceive of it. And it perfectly captured the tragedy of Neil Lennon's experience in Scottish football. It, it, it summed it up. It wasn't make-believe. It wasn't fiction. It wasn't a spoof film, it actually happened. It was really embarrassing for Scotland and for Scottish football. But it was tragic, it held up a mirror to us and it, and it showed a very ugly image back to us of what we were. The Scottish game was paying the money men in blood. Television audiences first, social consequences later but it still wasn't enough to save them. Satellite television and the money it brought in its wake was having a profound effect on the game. In June 2000, Sky injected another 1.1 billion into the English leagues. Scottish clubs, desperate for the same level of funding, attempted a renegotiation of their terms. The SPL they seemed to feel that English football was being paid X, so they should be paid X. But it's not like for like, you know? It's uh, two totally different things. You know, people in Scotland love to watch English football. I'm not sure people in England love to watch Scottish football. Scottish football is a little boy with a nose pressed against the window, and the other side of the window is English football and the billions. It is a glass window, but it's like 10 feet thick. We have entered into commercialism. We have made a deal with the devil, and the devil doesn't pay over the odds for what he doesn't want. We had done internal studies that talked about us getting almost double the monies we were getting on the current contract. The clubs were getting very excited. So excited that they started arguing about how to split the pie. That argument took six months. Six months long enough for the dot-com bubble to burst and for the planes to hit the Twin Towers. That money was no longer on the table, so the argument had been futile. It created a huge amount of bad blood, but we had missed our moment. Someone at the SPL had said to Sky, you're insulting Scottish football, take that offer off the table. So they took that off the table and went and insulted the English Football League instead, who were happy to take the money. And I think uh, the SPL suffered. The SPL had just turned down the biggest and only deal on the table. Without that money, Scottish clubs could not compete with other European clubs on the global stage. But Mitchell had an ace up his sleeve. The clubs hatched a plan to go it alone with a bold proposal for a self-run football television station, SPL TV. The other option is to do our own um, channel. People didn't know what that meant, so we had to spend a lot of time studying it, market research, preparing it, six months. And after every month, we went back to the clubs and said, here's our update, here's our update, are you all up for this? Yes, 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 yes. I didn't think SPL TV would ever fly. I thought they were sabre rattling. They were just trying to create competition where none existed, and I don't believe that it was ever serious. 
It was an innovative venture, especially in the days before YouTube and social media, but the bold business move relied on a united front. So when it was discovered, Celtic and Rangers had been in secret negotiations to leave the SPL, joining the better resourced English Premier League, the death knell was sounded before it had even begun. At the last meeting, Celtic and Rangers said no. It was a bit of a surprise that they said no. So much so that the 10 clubs asked them to leave the room and resign from the league. We have to give two years notice of our resignation. Celtic and Rangers have forced plans for a subscription-based SPL television channel to be abandoned. At a meeting of the 12 clubs this morning, the old firm wouldn't back the deal, which effectively puts an end to it. So you can imagine the whole project at that point died. And financially, it was a disaster for Scottish football. And that wasn't the only problem they faced. Roger Mitchell decided to give the negotiations with the broadcasters one more go, but found at one of his appointments with a friendly television executive that Rangers and Celtic weren't the only ones operating behind closed doors. He said, Roger, you don't really know what you were dealing with. And he turned his computer screen round and he showed uh, our internal business plan for SPL television, that he had known everything from the start. People, I don't know who it was, I can guess, had been telling him what we were planning to do, what I was planning to do. So it was like playing poker with your opponent knowing exactly the cards you had in your hand. All the money that had been there to allow them to compete in the new marketplace had just disappeared. I'm not angry about it. I just feel that it was a huge missed opportunity. A more modest agreement with BBC Scotland kept live football on air for the next two seasons before the arrival of a new big money deal this time with Dublin-based sports service, Citanta. Five years of stability followed, and then rumors of the broadcaster's financial problems began to emerge. I remember the very first time I appeared on radio in Scotland, going into the studio with a cutting from the Sunday Business Post, Ireland's Financial Times right, from the previous week. And it was a brilliant news story. Collapse of Satanta imminent. Hadn't been reported in Scotland. So I read it out on the radio and it kind of, it triggered this questioning of Satanta and eventually Satanta came out and said, yeah, actually we're in trouble here. And it was just another, another kicking for Scottish football. The clubs were going around with their hair on fire. You know, we're not going to survive. Armageddon, before the, the other Armageddon. That was the first time we get. <laughs> One of the reasons the SPL was created was to provide a more profitable model, keeping all the member clubs financially solvent. But with the collapse of the Sky and subsequent TV deals, financial ruin was back as a real possibility, especially for some of the smaller clubs. Motherwell thought that spending money would be the best way of improving their fortunes. In what he saw as a visionary move, the owner, John Boyle, appointed a former footballer as the chief executive. He's got considerable skill as a business person, as a person who knows the business of football, and his appointment as chief executive will be one further step along the road of building Motherwell up into one of the challenging clubs in Scotland. Over McCarthy's head this time, Nevin with Wilson, he's got round him. Will he try one from here? What a superb goal by Nevin! Pat Nevin had considerable experience in finance, his university degree in commerce and his experience of running players' associations helped him shape a business plan. I explained to John Bile after looking at it for a few months, this is going to cost you a lot of money. And if you want to be successful, it's going to cost you a hell of a lot of money. And I gave him three scenarios. You know, like an average side, a half decent side, and a side that could get third or fourth. It came out roughly at two million quid a year to get a side that would 
but if I third and fourth, <laughs> two million quid losses per year. And he said, yeah, okay. And I went, really? <laughs> okay, if you want it. So we put something in place there that kind of worked quite quickly. It was a short-term solution to a long-term problem, and it had been tried before. But the lessons of overspending had still not been learned. Clubs continued to hope that the more they spent and the higher their spot in the league, then the more money would come their way. But it was a gamble that rarely paid off. After the first season, got straight up battling with Hearts. A lot of teams have had bigger budgets than us anyway, but we were able to punch sort of fairly decently around and above our weight for a period of time. But I could feel that it wasn't right. You don't feel good when there's a you know, red part of the accounts. And that's when the problems kind of started for Motherwell, because understandably the owner thought, well, wait a minute, I was willing to lose X amount a year, but I'm not going to lose X amount a year plus another two million or whatever it is on top of that. Scottish football has been shaken by the news that the Premier League club Motherwell has gone into administration. The chief executive, Pat Nevin, has resigned and the court of session has been asked to appoint an administrator. The failure to agree a deal with Sky TV last year and the collapse of plans for SPL TV, which we wholeheartedly supported, were bitterly disappointing and extremely bad news for us financially. It's going to be very painful, it's going to be very difficult, but it is, quite honestly, the only possible way forward. The players dismissed by Motherwell yesterday as part of a cost-cutting exercise say they feel bitterly let down by the club. I think we're talking about a war between football and business here, and for the first time it's like the business are just uh, running all over football, and that's hard to understand. It will be... A slimline motherwell on a much lower cost base, and that may have a chance in the current climate of Scottish football of surviving. Motherwell did survive, just. After narrowly escaping relegation from the SPL, they limped on, but without much success. Subscription TV was where the money lay, but Scottish football was still outside the party, with its nose pressed up against the glass. Some clubs went for glamour in an effort to attract more TV coverage. Dundee were uniquely connected to Italian football, uh, and their management team were in charge of kind of, if you like, bringing in players. And they had these connections to actually some very, very talented players, of course, Argentinians, Italians, and all the rest of it. You know, Dundee signed guys like Claudia Kinesia. Who would have thought that an Argentinian World Cup star signing for Dundee? You know, they, they were bringing players from, from all over the world, and for a wee while, it was one of the finest Dundee sides that I'd seen in years. There's a game against Clyde midweek when Fabrizio Ravinelli comes off the bench and scores a hat-trick. We were almost bewitched by the romance of these players, their fame, their kind of celebrity. They were paying these players way beyond what their five and six thousand crowd could ever justify. The intention was to sell them on, and the experiment ended in failure. And whilst it might have been a great roller coaster for Dundee fans at the time, it tipped them into administration for the first and then subsequently a second time. With no lucrative sponsorship or broadcast deals in place, the clubs fell prey to individual deals from anyone with money to spend. Betna's five-year plan involves a new 6,000-seat stadium and entry to the SPL. OK, it sounds ridiculous for a town of less than 3,500 people, but with Mileson's millions, it might just be possible. Brooks Mileson was a self-made multimillionaire who had taken advantage of the expanding financial services market and had an interest in sport. I will put in the investment that's required here to meet our to meet the requirements and our ambition. I get sent down to Raydale to meet Brooks, so I'd never seen him, I didn't know who he was, and I go into the week in a boardroom, and I'm looking about for this guy, and there's a guy hoovering. 
This guy's hoovering him like that. He turns around and says, I'm looking for Brooks Melson. Oh, come here, you silly fool, big cuddle. Hi, I'm Brooks, and that was it. I was like, what are you doing doing the hoovering? He says, everybody does anything here. I wouldn't ask you to do anything I wouldn't do myself. And right away, you laugh. You're in love with a guy. It was like a carnival. My first game, there was guys in stilts. There was fire eating. There was candy floss everywhere. It was just a family oriented club. This was a story to rival anything offered by the old firm. Even if it was just one man's bank balance that was funding it. This is a title. He scores it. It's there. his dream, owning a football club, he was a guy in charge, but he was still a fan. He still travelled up with all his, his pals to the games, he never went into boardrooms. Three promotions in three years has never been done before and might never be repeated. There was no organisational structure in place to question how one small team from the lower divisions could storm through three leagues in as many years and whether it was sustainable. Brooks, smelling success, continued bankrolling the club with even more lavish weekly gifts. Bonuses included borrowing his luxury sports car as he doled out wage checks personally. Mileson did finally acknowledge the club's precarious situation. It can't be run viably. If it was run, if you try to run this viably, we'd have a part-time team as it was in the past, which is why we were in the lower leagues. Despite the problems, he pressed on. The tiny club rose up through the ranks and reached the showpiece event of the season, the Scottish Cup final. If you want a morality tale about Scottish football, go to the Cup final in which Gretna play Hearts, which was greeted in the Scottish media as a fairy tale. And in lots of ways, the sad thing about this was here was a club predicated on an ego-driven fantasy the affable, single-minded money man had bought his way to success, bringing with him on the journey to Hamden thousands of very happy customers. Brooks and everybody else within the club are in a porter cabin selling the tickets with Tupperware boxes. They've got the tickets in one box and the money's in the other, and you're like, just sell this, isn't it right? Why? How can we be in a cup final here? It was an absolute Ponzi scheme. It was a con of the worst kind. And they're playing in our National Cup final, and clowns and idiots are calling it a fairy tale. Do me a favour. Buying good players to improve a club's future was nothing new. But this was the first time it had been done in such a blatant way. I am convinced that on that day, a warning shot was fired about the failures of Scottish football. Do not spend what you can't afford, and Gretna did it in ways that were actually... The best word I can think for it was shameless. It was a house of cards. One small push and it would all topple down. And just a few seasons after the cup final, topple it did when Mileson suffered a rapid deterioration in his health. I think it fell away so quickly due to the fact that when Brooks took unwell, he couldn't communicate. And, and his wife, Jerry, took the decision where, unless my husband tells me to write a cheque for anything, it's stopping, and it was that quick. It was that day, no other money came into the club. The club's income from football is insufficient to sustain it. 
It cannot pay its wages, it cannot pay its commitments without the support of Mr Mileson. Following a board meeting on Friday the 7th, the directors passed a resolution to place the club into administration. Brooks Mileson died in November 2008. He left financial chaos in his wake and a club and fans in mourning. With no long-term strategy in place, few checks on the ownership of clubs and little coming in from TV deals, the clubs were growing increasingly dependent on anyone who had the money and desire to own a football club. The rapidly changing social circumstances around the world would also have a significant effect on Scotland's game. The Soviet Parliament today formally voted the USSR and itself out of existence. The breakup of the USSR had brought into being a whole new breed of oligarch. The most famous was Roman Abramovich at Chelsea in England, and in Scotland arrived Vladimir Romanov. Greeted like a conquering hero by the weary Hearts fans. Where do you start with Vladimir Romanov? I mean, here's this guy who gets involved in the banking system in Lithuania during a time where uh, Russia and the various independent states are privatising their gas and their electricity and their oil and all the rest of it, and all sorts of bandits are flooding in there. And Romanov, uh, through his banking, becomes involved in Scottish football. Some people would say, well, actually, at the time, he was looking to set up a Lithuanian uh, Yukio Bank, as a Lithuanian bank with a headquarters in Edinburgh to move into the banking system here in the UK. That's one of the kind of theories around it. Romanov saw in Hearts an opportunity to play on the global stage, a chance to promote his bank, its logo emblazoned on all the club's merchandise. On both they will be champions of Europe in 10 years' time. I promise to build here a new stadium. And it'll be a stadium with the best atmosphere in the world. Hearts had been in financial turmoil for years. Badly in debt, the board had taken a controversial decision to sell the stadium for housing redevelopment. It's the end of an era for Hearts Football Club. After months of speculation, a deal has been done to sell off its Tyne Castle ground. Nothing short of the arrival of a major new investor can secure Tyne Castle's future now. This sale had been a step too far for the loyal fans and they mounted a campaign against chairman Chris Robinson in a bid to prevent it. After several failed attempts to buy into Dunfermline, Dundee and Dundee United, this gave Romanov the chance he'd been waiting for. Within minutes, Hart supporters changed their loyalty from a local businessman who had been with the club for years to a bank-owning oligarch with mysterious motives. The financial injection had immediate results. The team headed the league, generating huge media interest. Television channels flocked to Tynecastle for live coverage, documentaries and rolling news reports. We can win the league, but I buy the players. That's the message from Hearts major shareholder Vladimir Romanov. There was an occasion where the boy Tal came for a trial. We didn't think he was quite you know, to the standard. We went home, and then within the next week, he arrived at the ground. He'd all signed a three-year contract, and he was in my squad. So I think when that moment happened, um, it was never going to work out. Burley had achieved great success. His team were riding high at the top of the league, ahead of the old firm. But after a number of high-profile disagreements with Romanov, George Burley was sacked. Quite incredible. I think we played 12 games at the time, and 
I think we'd won 10 and drawn two. There was obviously a disappointment because George had built a good rapport with the players, we had a real belief in the way that we were playing. I always remember this, that he'd been at the club for three months and I think uh, on his mantelpiece sat three Manager of the Month awards and we were losing our manager, so, you know, in that respect it was quite bizarre. Romanov had the money and he also wanted to have his say in how the club was run. A strategy that put him at odds with almost everyone. The treatment of some individuals during that period of time was horrendous. The honesty, the transparency, just in all the things that I think are really important in the foundations of a football club, I, I thought were being disregarded. And um, it got to the point where I felt I had to speak out on behalf of all of these people. A lack of stability and a constant turnaround of managers it was up to the man who had to deal with it on an almost daily basis to question in public what was really going on. Stephen. The club captain summoned the media. There is only so much a coaching staff, a captain and certain colleagues can do without the full backing, direction and coherence of the manager and those running the football club. The last two years have been very testing for the players. Together we have faced a number of challenges and worked hard at retaining some degree of unity. However, due to the circumstances, morale, understandably, is not good, and there is significant unrest within the dressing room. At no time did Vladimir ever come and face me after I made that statement. I don't think he had the courage to face me. I felt let down. You know, I'd went from being a captain there for many, many years to being exiled. But again, the amazing thing was, the day that I was told I'd no longer a future at Hearts, I was also offered the assistant manager's job. Presley left in 2006. The club limped on under Romanov for another seven seasons. Romanov brought in more and more Eastern Bloc talent, building a team in his own image, but with no clear purpose. I believe at one point we had about 80 players on the, on the payroll. Um, none of that made any sense. There was no stopping him. He became this reckless and kind of egocentric uh, owner of hearts who took them on this kind of roller coaster journey and then, of course, sacked their manager and another manager and another manager and sacked just about anybody that ever said anything that he disagreed with. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was always like he was a Bond villain or something like that. And here he was in charge of a Scottish football team. In 2008, the global financial system went into meltdown. The system in which Romanov was a participant collapsed. His business rode the storm, but he was eventually cornered in 2011. Sought by the authorities for suspected embezzlement and fraud, hounded into hiding in his homeland, Romanov left his staff players and fans back in Edinburgh sifting through the rubble. Looking for money, it wasn't there. No idea yet, no idea. Hearts Football Club will go into administration within the next 24 hours. The Edinburgh Club has been in financial meltdown for some time with debts of 25 million pounds. We have inherited a fairly bleak situation in terms of there is no cash in the club at the moment. That particular day when they had that, that press conference, I walked out of Tynecastle and I thought, oh, this, this, is, this could be curtains. And there is also no income due to the club. I mean, if there were, the messages they were sending out were so grim. So that's put us in the situation where it's been very regrettable, but as of today, 
we've had to make 14 administrative staff, nine full-time and five part-time redundant. The vibe was, was so, so negative. Well, we've got to be honest, it's as desperate as anything I've seen. But, you know, from that potential disaster grows this kind of inspirational story. Trying to look at the positive side of it, we all know there's a huge fan base here. Hearts had something that Gretna didn't. Rich community roots and a large fan base who might just provide a saviour. I was approached initially by the group that is now the Foundation of Hearts, they kind of felt the, the supporters needed to stand up and try and take a little bit of control of the, of the club. Entrepreneur, computer software and IT specialist, and with a degree in psychology, Anne Budge is an award-winning businesswoman and a heart season ticket holder. I did think, you know, this cannot be rocket science. There has got to be a way of running a football club without losing millions of pounds every year. What if I, I help? So I'll basically um, advance the funds, buy the club, and then the supporters can take time to buy it back again. A football club isn't a toy, you know, rich man's or otherwise. It's a business. You know, it shouldn't be played with. It should be run appropriately and properly. Desperate for cash, Romanov's administrators agreed to the fans' offer with Ann Budge's help to buy the club. Could fan ownership with community backing succeed where individual and corporate efforts had failed? Romanov was only one of many bank owners devastated by the global financial crisis. Even businesses deemed too big to fail, such as the Royal Bank of Scotland, collapsed, but were rescued by the taxpayers. Then it was the turn of one of the biggest institutions in Scotland's game to come under scrutiny. If somebody wants to come in and do a better job than me and wants to take a serious interest, I'm happy to talk to them. I don't think it's about money I would be reasonable to deal with if I thought it was in the best interest of the club. But all the people who say they're going to do this, they're going to do that, and they're going to raise money, and they share schemes from the trust and that, none of that comes to fruition. Nobody's delivered an offer that is serious, in my opinion, in the best interest of the club. Rangers had once been valued at £110 million, but over the years, that value became a fantasy. Just like the signs of the global financial crash, the warning signs at Rangers had been ignored, even denied. Of course there's money available. This is Rangers Football Club. The basic overdraft of the football club at the year end was £21 million, and I'm comfortable with that. The shareholders are comfortable with that, but it makes great sensational copy for you people who want to make it look as if we're in a crisis or something. Rangers Football Club have just announced their worst ever annual results. Allowing for interest, the Ibrox Club has lost just over 35... It did take a while for people to say, hang on, this is, this is unsustainable. This is like industrial scale spending. How in the name of God can they afford this? There was a famous interview with Hugh Adams, the Rangers director, who said, this will crash and it will burn and it will happen sooner or later because that is business. You cannot have those outlays with that income and hope for a happy ending. The financial situation also had a considerable impact on what happened on the pitch. When I came to Celtic in the year 2000, I said that Rangers were spending £12 million on a player like Tori Henry Flo. They were bringing class players uh, from the continent across and looked as if they were able to afford to be able to do that. David Murray had found a loophole in the tax system, giving him more disposable cash than the rest of Scottish football, allowing him to buy more players. Don't take salaries, don't pay tax, just take loans, we'll call EBTs, Employment Benefit Trust. Just take these loans, you don't really ever have to pay them back, and you just get cash. 
and you don't have to pay tax on it. You have to pay PAYE. That means you can buy more expensive players, you gain advantage on the pitch. Yes, says David and the lads. For the first 10 years of the century they do this, Rangers win no fewer than 12 trophies while all this is going on. 47 million quid is shelled out in these loans and directors buy second houses in France, Rangers get expensive players, success on the pitch. In making use of EBTs, Rangers drew on advice from tax specialists and subsequently some judges agreed with their position when tested in court. What Rangers were doing was no more than part of that Wild West, out of control global culture where tax avoidance, as opposed to tax evasion, which is of course illegal, um, is ingrained in everybody's culture. Everybody's doing it, and if you're doing it better than the others, you gain commercial advantage. This could be the championship winning goal if Mikel Arteta can hold his nerve. You've seen how close it was in terms of winning the championship. It was a goal, in it? We were so level, it wasn't, it wasn't true. Mikel! Rangers have won their 50th title. So if they didn't pay the same kind of money that Celtic paid the players, we'd have been behind them. You wind up being a football club which is buying players in its own words that it couldn't otherwise afford to gain presumably and seemingly sporting advantage, otherwise else would you do it. It gains sporting advantage, they win 12 trophies in the first decade of this century and lo and behold, no one's paying tax. The spending at Ibrox was based on loans and debts and the banks demanded a closer look at their accounts. At the point when the banking crisis happened, the cosier relationship that David Murray had with the bank began to change. They started to want to call in all the major debts that they had, not just Rangers, but all major debts. And a condition of the debt was that they put a banker on the board of Rangers who was seen, you read about it in the press all the time, where they were turning around and saying, this guy's stopping them buying big players and all the rest of it. And you're thinking, are you really getting what's going on here? HMRC issued the club with a multi-million pound tax bill. David Murray was forced to act. David Murray had got to a stage where when he sold Rangers, a global brand name with some of the largest, most devoted, most passionate, most loyal fans in the world, he'd reduced that to an edifice which was worth one pound. And the only reason it was sold for a pound was because he was desperate to get rid of it. He had to, he was under pressure from his own bank, from the Murray Group, Murray Group were in trouble. Um, and he had, to, he had to offload it. That is a catastrophe and that is a financial mismanagement of big business, big culture, big football, the like of which I don't think we've seen anywhere else, certainly in these islands. If I move on from Rangers, I will leave it in the hands of people that I think have got the best into the club. The only guy that will buy it is a bizarre, slightly water mystery character called Craig White. It's very exciting. A supposed billionaire, he didn't turn out to be a billionaire at all. And I remember talking to David Murray actually in the preamble to the final deal being done, because I'd never spoken to Craig White up to that point. And I said, what's he like? And Murray said, he reminds me of a young me. I said, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And he told me he was convinced that Craig White was the answer. If Craig White was the answer, I didn't know what the question was. Craig White only arrived because there was an opportunity an organisation was being sold by someone that knew that the debt it was carrying was unsustainable. The first interview I did with Craig White, he had said, other than being a slightly regrettable event, I don't see what the big deal about Rangers going into, in, into administration would be. And in hindsight, you can see that was the plan. Rangers have launched an intention of going into administration with the court. With Rangers on the verge of administration, what are the footballers with even greater adversity? 
what we've done today uh, was the most practical way forward to safeguard the long-term survival of Rangers, which is what we're all about, and prevent the possible closure of the club. We, we hope to continue discussions with HMRC and have practical proposals in place. I've spoken to the manager, the staff and sports representatives this afternoon and have outlined the position. This is a difficult day for Rangers, but will emerge a fitter and stronger result for this. Thank you, thank you very much. And he must go. He must. He go. shouldn't be allowed to rule. We need to know what's happening at this club. That is a problem. Nobody seems to want to talk to the fans. The fans are the people who bring the, the cash into this club to make it run, and that's what needs to happen. That house will stay open, and the fans will make sure it stays open. Because we are the people. We are the people, and that will never be taken away from us. Wait, let's go. Wait, let's go. Wait, let's go. Since the inception of the SPL, five of its members had entered administration. But now, Rangers were heading for an even greater demise, liquidation, which would mean exclusion from the professional football leagues. It was very, very difficult for the Scottish press and for other branches of Scottish society to deal with the idea that there might be no Rangers. I think that, that they found that perilously difficult to imagine and in lots of ways it was beyond the idea that they, how they framed the way that Scottish football was. This is about big sport, like big banking going badly out of control. It is about an organisation which uh, perhaps perceives itself and is certainly perceived by the authorities, and that is critical in Scottish football, as it was in banking, as being too big to fail. The brand must be protected, the power, the reach, the, the place that, that, that this club has indeed in Scottish culture um, must somehow be protected, can't go to the wall. Rangers applied for membership of the football leagues, hopeful this would see them accommodated within the top tier. When it came to deals with the media, the SPL had backed the old firm brand with an all-in bet. Future prosperity had been built on that rivalry and displays of tribal aggression. But the rest of Scottish football had had enough, and the fans of the other teams demanded to have a say in the unfolding drama. Well, I think in this case, fan power really came to play. I think a lot of football chairmen who were keen to keep Rangers in the Premiership for obvious financial uh, reasons found that the fan base just weren't going to tolerate it. Our season ticket sales were about a quarter of what they would have been normally at that particular time. And the fans basically said, if you vote them back in, we're not buying a season ticket. The financial effect for us as a club of not having a season ticket sales would have just be enormous. We went what well, was right for our club. We had to do that, as many other clubs did. The decision to place Rangers in the lowest tier of the professional game would have been unthinkable only months before. The Scottish Football League's only acceptable position will be to place Rangers FC into the third division of the Isle of Scottish Football League. It's an extraordinary story of how a club can be brought from the very zenith of Scottish football pretty much to start again. For me, it all goes back to David Murray and Hubris. Spending money that he didn't have, ego and the EBT disaster. I would blame David Murray for the collapse of Rangers. Sir David Murray denies any financial mismanagement during his time in charge of the club. This period also saw major restructuring of the football league system in Scotland. And, despite the crisis at Rangers, the predicted downfall of Scottish football failed to materialise. 
from the perspective of some football fans, it's been a great period. We've seen lots of competitive football. There is no question that uh, from the vantage point of St. Johnson fans, we've qualified for Europe three times in the trot. We've had some great wins, particularly away in Europe as well. Meanwhile, the Highland teams are going on, uh, getting to cup finals. Inverness are winning cups and all the rest of it. From the point of view of many other clubs in Scotland, this has been a great era for the game. After four years and several changes in boardroom and club management, Rangers Football Club is now back in the top flight. Football had gone global. But questionable decisions at the start of it all had left Scotland's clubs struggling to play catch up and vulnerable to predators. Watching the way that these bandits who'd been in financial control, this series of robber barons, you realise that capitalists are in it for themselves. They're in it for a profit. It made me realise that fan ownership has to be the way ahead. One enduring constant throughout the lifetime of the SPL are the fans. Always there, always ready to help. It is the supporters who genuinely have the best interests of their clubs at heart. The Hearts supporters were remarkable. They were almost entirely progressive. Don't look back, look forward. We're still quite a long way off from even fully understanding how it will work at Hearts. The one thing I am sure of is that there is not one right model here. There are more examples of where it hasn't worked or where it's caused problems than there are of where it has worked. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work to be done on that. I think there's a yawning gap opened up now between the authorities running the game and the football fan. And the football fan out there is thinking, you know, you, you say constantly that you, you value us, you say constantly that you're listening to us. Where's the evidence? And I have to agree with them to a large extent. I don't see much evidence that football fans in this country are being listened to. As the dust settles on the 30-year revolution, and wise heads make sense of the triumph, transformation and turmoil, the way ahead remains uncertain. Our club football may be doing well at local level, but in the 17 years since that first failed Sky Deal, Scottish football has never managed to attract the investment that would deliver on its ambitions. Players, managers, oligarchs, bankers and tycoons have all attempted to play the game, but a lack of any sustainable structure at a higher level means that it's still every club for itself. And until that changes, Scottish football will continue to have its face pressed up against that glass window. If you're living in bed with an elephant, as the Scots were, there was a tremendous incentive for David to beat Goliath. There's something special, an elixir about football that is almost kind of alcoholic. If you don't want to play for your country, then there's something wrong with you. You've lost a game where the expectations were that you should win it. How do you deal with that? And the newspaper front page has got, I should get the sack. And Alec Ferguson walked in the room, said a couple of words, Jock's dead. And you can see that next episode of Scotland's Game next Thursday at 9 here on BBC One Scotland. And there are more details coming up in just a moment.